Hey, little sister, what's the worst show ever? That gets my goat. Yeah? Nice. Hi, everybody, this is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. It's summertime-ish, so it's still movie time, right? I, I think summer ended like the last week in July. Oh, really? Because nothing came out in August. I... Is that why it was... it was the worst August in the history of all movies ever? I think it might have had a lot to do with that, yeah. That would be a problem. It's but, hard to sell tickets to no movies. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. But, I mean, I got to blame the studios for not releasing stuff. It's just like, no, no, we, we always release things in May, June, and July. That's the rule. Sorry, we, 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 we blew our wads. We've got nothing left <laughs> in August. Let's see. Well, let's, let's bring Wonder Woman out again. Didn't they do Guardians of the Galaxy Part 1 in August? Was it in August? I don't know. I know Suicide Squad was. I thought it was like first week of August for that one. And it was like, is this the throwaway? But did they put it here because they don't care? And then it did great. And everybody's like, oh, August is back. Everybody's going to release stuff in August now. Uh, okay, so today we'll, we're doing a special Stephen King edition. Stephen King movie edition of the That Gets My Boat, that gets my boat podcast. So... We just saw this weekend, which was the weekend of September 9th and 10th. 8th, 9th, and 10th, I guess is what it counts as. Okay. That's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That was it. Stephen King's fantastically long book (laughs) came out in the uh, early 80s. And then earlier, what, what about... The Dark Tower, was that released in August? It was. uh, It was August uh, 4th. Ah, so it took the Guardians of the Galaxy slot and (laughs) fell on its face. It did, yes. Sorry, let me interrupt just for a second. I I feel bad because I sort of made you see the Dark Tower, and I made (laughs) you see it for nothing. And I think you thought, well, maybe we can salvage some of that by doing this episode where we talk about the two Stephen King adaptations. But, um, yeah, I I called you right after I saw Dark Tower and ranted, and I I don't know that I can even remember all that much of my rant. So I I imagine we'll talk very briefly about Dark Tower, and and the rest of it will be about it. Do you have the same idea? Uh, That's fine with me. uh, I, I think it all depends. You know, you ranted at me, but then once I saw it, it, I mean, it's possible it might just dredge all that back up to the surface again, and you might go off on your rant again. I don't know. I hope so. The uh, yes. the interesting thing is we have two books by the same author. His two magnum opi, magnum opies, magnum, magnum opioids, Ah, I think is what they use for that. I've just been hearing a lot about opioids anyway, so that must be what it is. I think that was uh, Andy Griffith's son, opioid. Oh, okay. That makes sense as to why I heard it a lot, because uh, The Dark Tower was uh, directed, no, produced by Andy Griffith's son, was it not? (laughs) It was. That's a good point. Yeah, it was something that Warner Brothers had been developing for years, and they had this... this, um, What's the word? Ambitious idea about Ron Howard directing, was it a trilogy of movies? I think three movies of the Dark Tower series. And then in between each movie release, there would be a television prequel talking about Roland's youth and the fall of Gilead and his lost lady love and sort of the backstory of how he became the man that you see in the uh, the feature films. And Warner Brothers came really, really close to making this, and then they chickened out. I, I, I guess there were some projects, some really ambitious projects, like Cowboys and Aliens and John Carter of Mars, <laughs> uh, Lone Ranger, that 
were expensive and then they failed. And so they're like, nope, we're not going to do this. Uh, and, and they just threw that out and they decided, well, we'll just do a movie, an adaptation of The Dark Tower. And they did it on the cheap, which is usually nice. But uh, Ron Howard is still written down as the uh, the producer, a, a producer of that, because, you know, he shepherded this project so far along. But I, I went and saw it opening night um, because I have a friend that's a really big Stephen King fan. And the two of us, we used to always talk about his books and a friend. I went and saw it because of my friend. I I no I I just wanted to know because a, a friend want was asking me. I don't know. I don't really understand what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, I didn't. It didn't look good to me. I think me. I know a guy who's a really big Stephen King fan, and I'm not so sure if it's your friend per se. Well, no, no. I'm a big Stephen King fan, but because of that, I didn't want to go see this movie. Oh, okay. It didn't feel right. And there was a lot of, of negative buzz as the movie was about to come out. Just um, It was one of those that they didn't release for critics. And that's usually a bad sign. <laughs> uh, if you're proud of your product, you want to get it in front of people whose words matter. Um, people not like Big and Rish of the Doonstief. <laughs> but anyway, we went and saw it. And be right before the movie started, because I had avoided all the trailers, I was telling him about, you know, oh, it, what if it did this? Or what, what if... <laughs> I, I, I guess I thought that it was going to be an adaptation of The Gunslinger, which is the first book in the Dark Tower series. And the shortest book, the easiest to adapt. Not realizing that it was going to be an adaptation somehow of the Dark Tower series where they picked and chose parts from the different books, See, all the way to the seventh book. Let's grab this little part and put it in here. And yeah, I just, after I saw it, I had to call you. I, I, I can't even remember if you were stuck in the car, but I just, I walked around the block angrily ranting <laughs> about the movie. And all the neighbors closed their blinds and said, he's out there again. He's made another <sighs> lap. Lock the doors. Honey, dial 9-1, and we'll just... Get, have... Load the gun, just in case. What upset me the most about the movie was that it was the opposite of this ambitious idea of three movies and series, and, you know, we're going to tell this thing, we're going to invest all this money in it and passion in it. It was tepid and half-hearted and safe and bland. It wasn't that it was even crappy or a really bad movie. It was just nothing special. You know, there's almost something to be said for a movie that's terrible. Where you're like, oh my gosh, you've got to see how bad this movie is. Because then you can rant about it. We can still talk about Batman and Robin two decades later. I never saw it again after 1997. And I still can <laughs> quote that movie because yeah. it was, you know... It was special in how terrible it was. But Dark Tower wasn't that. It was just you saw it and then you forgot about it. Yeah, I think the only people who really remember the movie are the ones who were the absolute die hardest fans of the books. Those people remember it because they're like, damn it, it, it just ruined the chances of anything ever going anywhere with this series. Uh, I, I think you were talking to, to me about this not too long ago, where you were saying that there was some website where they were, they were listing off the, oh, what could be the next Game of Thrones? Because Game of Thrones is coming to an end. It's only got one more season. Everybody wants a Game of Thrones, and they listed off just a whole bunch of properties that could be the next Game of Thrones or the next Walking Dead, the next big hit that everybody uh, feels they have to watch. Because everyone wants one of those. Every network is looking for one of those. They're all making their own version of it. It's like uh, sci-fi is making 
The Expanse, which they call Game of Thrones, Thrones in Space. Thrones, 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 I think that's the actual official title of it. They bagged the title of The Expanse and just changed it to Game of Thrones in Space. <laughs> but uh, we've got a Game of Thrones, but ours is set in high school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this Dark Tower series is perfect for something like that. It's something that's really, really long, large in scope. Uh, you know, really deep and full of stuff and could be a good multi-season hardcore, you know, television show. But that's not going to happen. Not for a long time. Not until I'm sure this golden age of TV drama fades away and uh, we're back to, I don't know, sitcoms or whatever the heck comes next. Because... Yeah, I mean, this movie came out and it couldn't interest people to actually show up and see it, despite there being millions upon millions of Stephen King fans. So, I can understand people hating that. People who are big fans of things tend to remember the one adaptation that flopped and ruined it for any other uh, possibility. But yeah, nobody else is going to remember. That is for sure... I read all those novels, all the uh, Dark Tower novels. I read The Gunslinger in high school, and truthfully, I didn't like it very much. It was dark, kind of obtuse, and hard to uh, really understand. Um, kind of it really slow in its pacing. There wasn't... Anyone to really latch on to and enjoy. Maybe you could like Jake as a character, but he was left to die. You know, it was just not the kind of book that makes you think, oh boy, I can't wait for the next one. But, you know, Stephen King gives you a whole teaser at the end. Oh yeah, this will happen and this will happen and this. So get ready. But I didn't get around to ever reading the second book for more than a more than a dozen years, I would say, probably, before, uh, just by chance, I think it was the drawing of the three that first introduced me to Frank Muller, although it could have been the other way around, I can't remember. I got really into Frank Muller, either because of listening to the drawing of the three, or the drawing of the three was just part of while I was really into him. Uh, but I think what happened was I listened to the drawing of the three, and I loved it so much, especially Frank Muller's reading, that I went through and just started listening to any audiobook that Frank Muller had narrated. Which was odd, too, because it put Great Expectations back in my hands, which I'd read in uh, freshman year in English, and I'd hated. But I listened to it again, read by Frank Muller, and suddenly the book opened up to me, and I understood it way better and I loved it so much more. So those are two books that I really love because of Frank Muller, I think. Um, but yeah, The Drawing of the Three suddenly got me all into The Dark Tower. And so I went through and read all that was available at the time. And then eventually Stephen King, worried about the fact that he may die very, very soon, plowed through the rest of the series and publish them one after the next after the next. I read those too, but by that point, I guess my fervor for The Dark Tower had worn off. And so the, the books beyond, what was the fourth book? The Wastelands, or was that third? The fourth was Wizard and Glass. Okay. That was the one that was like half flashback prequel and half present day stuff, yeah. I think once I made it through that one, and then I had to, I waited a little while before I got to the other ones, that was when my fervor kind of wore off. And truthfully, I don't remember the last two books very well. The fifth one was Wolves of the Callow, right? Right. I remember that one relatively well, but six and seven I don't even remember very well. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not a huge fan of the series. I've read it all, but uh, there's no fire in my belly for this this series. 
And so I guess I'm not one of those people who was really up in arms and upset that they made a bland version of the of the show or of the story. Truthfully, I didn't hate the movie. And I guess you were saying you didn't hate it either. It wasn't detestable. It was just blah. It was just lukewarm. And I felt that way. It seemed like they took uh, the Dark Tower and turned it into a standard Hollywood action-adventure movie. They made it exactly like every other movie that you've seen in the last, I don't know, almost probably 10 years or more. They just took that formula and just copied it right in. It wasn't terrible. I didn't go home thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. But it also wasn't exciting. I don't know, it's, it's interesting because like it, uh, the Dark Tower is just a huge thing that you can draw a ton from. And it's really difficult to winnow it down. I don't know why they decided to try to, uh, to do it all in one. Um, they left out so much of the good stuff because of it. With it, they had a different plan where they decided to make, I'm not sure how, the young half, the flashback half, the 50s half, what would you call the half that they did? The period half? The children half? The oh children's yeah, there was that part where she got the tampons. Yeah, we'll call it the children half. The, the, the half of the book where they were children, which in the book itself was set in the 50s because the flash forward part was in the 80s, but now that we've gone all the way to the future, now the, <laughs> the children's half was uh, set in my high school years, and the present day is going to be uh, when everybody's as old as I am. That's sad. But anyways, uh, yeah, they, their plan was we'll just do half of it, and if it does well, then we'll do the other half. And the Dark Tower could have benefited from something like that, where they said, like you thought it was going to be, oh, this is the gunslinger. We'll do the gunslinger, and if it does well, then we'll do the drawing of the three. And if that does well, then we'll do the wastelands, and et cetera, et cetera. You just keep going from there, you know? You can just keep adding to it. It's really sad that they didn't try their original plan, although I'm not surprised because it sounded super ambitious. But it would have been cool, wouldn't it, to have TV and movie properties all mixed together? I mean, that's what, like, the Marvel Universe was supposed to be when they came out with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. But for some reason they've shied away from that so much that there's barely been any crossover. Uh, not since the first season has there been anything worth even mentioning. And, uh, and the other TV properties, which are also set in the same world, and they'll say, oh, not since the incident did this happen and whatever. You know, they'll just talk about things that happened and other... But we never see anybody, never see anything. There's no actual crossover. So it would have been really cool if they could have done something like that where it's actual, you know? I mean, it's like uh, shows where, like, for fun to promote their show... A little bit in the off season, they do webisodes that the the people that are the real diehards will know exist and will actually watch them online. Didn't you watch? Didn't they do a webisode of was it Agents of Shield? The Yo Yo character, I guess there was a there were webisodes about. But yeah, I mean that's a that's a similar thing taking various platforms and you know working them together. That's cool. I would like to see more of that. It almost feels like smell vision or something, you know, like the, the old days where they tried to do more than just, you know, video and audio. They're like, well, we'll, we'll add in smell or that 4D or whatever it was thing they did at Universal Studio where they had live actors yeah. uh, playing the parts. Then they would come down and do stuff and then they would act like they went back and then they would be in the screen again. You know, something like that. That's Completely different, but kind of reminiscent of just the idea of having something in the movies, and then it's on TV, and then it's back in the movies, 
and it's back on TV, and then there's a webisode. It's just interesting, and I'm, I, I find it a shame that it doesn't exist. And instead, what we have is this. I mean, I didn't realize that you weren't that big of a fan of the series. I, you would always say, there was a door. There was a, that's, yes. That's the line that I love so much for and some you, reason. I think it's just because it happened several times. And Frank Muller is just so great with that. There was a door. <laughs> but, I, I, you know, after me lambasting the movie or the the studio behind it or, or just, you know, the, again, their cowardice or their play it safedness. There's probably a word for that. But I think cowardice serves. Why is it that you went and saw it? Well, I wasn't going to, but I think you sent me texts saying maybe you should go and see it and we could do an episode about it and it might be worth it. But you tricked me, sir. What? I tricked you? <laughs> you tricked me into seeing it. And then I finally said, okay, I'll go and see it. And so I went and saw it. And then you didn't want to do the episode. <laughs> and I laughed and said, sucker. I'm like, I did my homework. Let's do this episode. And you're like, eh, I'm uh, washing my hair that night. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk a bit about The Dark Tower. That, it's not like nothing worked in that movie. I felt like Matthew McConaughey was actually quite good as the man in black, but he had so little to work with. Um, and, and see, I also had a hard time with the gunslinger. I, for some reason, read Drawing of the Three before I read The Gunslinger and felt like... Oh, okay felt like the second book was much stronger than the first and yeah, and that yes. I just I didn't like how amoral and unlikable Roland was. I was young enough there's just like well why is he that way and you know there's a lot of stuff in that first book in the gunslinger that would be risky to bring to the big screen. I mean the biggest thing I think is Roland sacrificing Jake Chambers to his quest for the tower. It's it's bold and people don't do that because it's just not a likable thing for your protagonist to do. And so not only did they not do that, but all of the rough edges of Roland's character, in fact, all of the rough edges of Midworld were gone. And just like you said, it became an action movie like every other action movie. In fact, there were scenes that seemed to be ripped off from other movies in there. And if Gunslinger is anything, it's unique. You know, the Dark Tower series is unlike anything because it's a sci-fi, Western fantasy, parallel universe. I, I, I don't know what, how to even describe it. It's, it's yeah, many it different things. It has a lot of moving pieces for sure. A lot of different elements all thrown into one. And, uh, the filmmakers, for some reason, I mean, I guess, for fear of not making their money back, uh, decided, well, let's for just... For safety's sake. Well, for safety's sake, yeah, they just made a bland film with a beginning, a middle, and an end, but that's not how you start a franchise. I mean, they didn't even try to say, here are three or four things that need to be resolved in the future. So come on back, guys. We're going to try and pump one of these out every other year. It it played it so... It was a bunt. Rather than attempt a, <laughs> a, a home run or even a, a solid double, they just said, okay, we're going to bunt. And it was not the choice to make. There wasn't even anybody on base, and they bunted. Yeah, it feels like a waste, I guess. Like, why would you pay for this property... If you weren't going to try at least a little bit to do it justice. I'm sure it cost a fair amount, I would think, to acquire this property. Rather than just make up your own similar ripoff. Just be like, hey, I like the gunslinger, so I'm going to make a milk toast version of it. That people would stand for. And we'll call it Desperado. Or, <laughs> I don't know. Some, some random cowboy-ish thing. 
It just seems like a bummer. Aren't, aren't they also in the process of doing The Stand? And they're doing that as several movies? Well, certainly they will now. A month ago, perhaps, those plans were on hold. But yeah, there was talk of doing The Stand as a single feature film. And it's just like, dude, uh. don't even try to do that. Look at The Dark Tower. They didn't even try. <laughs> no, I mean, that's not true. They did try, but they tried to tell a single 90-minute narrative from thousands and thousands of pages of King books. And, and But the thing that's... The other thing that was so surprising about The Dark Tower was as unfaithful as it was to the books, it was jam-packed from beginning to end with references to other Stephen King properties as sort of a tip of the hat to the audience, to the fans. But these fans would be the ones that would say, hey, hey whoa, 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 but this isn't the gunslinger. Guys, what? It's like, I, okay, yeah, you can have Cujo in it and Christine and 1408 all you want, but this isn't the gunslinger. I, I just, I'm not really sure why they, unless they thought that that would be distracting, that people would be like, oh, cool, hey, and then the clown was there, and oh, hey, here's Johnny, oh, hey, guys, look at that. And you're like, okay, that's that's great. They referenced Salem's Lot in a movie. That makes up for all of the changes. Yeah, like they're going to think that's enough. Hey, they didn't make the movie that I wanted, but at least they threw in some shiny bits for me to look at. Yay. Okay, so... We, we probably have said enough about the Dark Tower, I think. Unless you have more that you want to say, do you? Well, you can probably remember, or maybe you can't. Maybe it was as forgettable as the movie. Some of the stuff I ranted about that <laughs> night. But it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a good example of what not to do. Because like you said, if you're not going to go for, to appeal to, to try to satiate the rabid fans, the ones that brought you to the dance, then why not just call it something else? Why Why did you bother buying the rights? Yeah, I think it would have been better served if they just invented their own similar universe and didn't call it that. I called it the gun flinger. Because <laughs> it wasn't the Dark Tower, really. and And pretty much everyone who really loves those books, really despises that movie and is just utterly incensed that it exists at all. But yeah, I don't know. You were saying, and I think this is maybe the biggest change that I, I disliked was, yeah, Roland's character is nothing like Roland's character. He's just a standard... Uh, action hero never has that complete single-mindedness that he has in the books he's almost like the terminator in search of the dark tower you know nothing else matters you know i mean the the big thing when he sacrifices jake to the slow muties you know that's gone and that's one of those big deals that uh informs his character and he has I don't know, does he, I, I, does he learn in the end? Does he change? Or does he keep at it? Does, does, I mean, he does learn to, to love others. Jake comes back again to split his mind in two. And there's Eddie and Susanna and Oi. Wasn't it sad that there was no Oi? It didn't even occur to me that they left Oi out. But it shouldn't surprise me. It's like that yeah, was something I mean, really charming that would be fun to uh, try and attempt on the big screen. So, of course, they didn't try. <laughs> Oi was one of my favorites. And the part... I have a tendency to cry a lot at movies. When movies do something, you know, that is emotional. There's really heavy emotional uh, things going on. And they, you know, do the things that they do in movies like bringing up the music and all that kind of stuff that uh, 
helps to pull at your emotions. I'm I'm a sucker for that stuff. I cry really easy, but a book is different. You know, they're just words on a page and you're just reading them silently to yourself as you sit there. And so generally I don't cry even if something is way more emotional uh, or more moving in a book. Um, there's very few times that I've cried uh, while reading books. But when Roland is marching towards the tower and he starts saying that this is for this guy and for that guy and for this guy, and when he says, for Oi, the brave, for some reason, that was the part that made me start uh, tearing up and wanting to cry. Of all the people that he named off, all the important people like Eddie and Susanna and everybody, it was for Oi the Brave that he did this, and that uh, that made me cry. It was really sad that Oi was, uh, had sacrificed himself. But, yeah, Roland's character just, it didn't, it didn't have the special stuff that it could have had. Um, the different feel to it. And, you know, it, there have been times when there was characters like this, because, I mean... From what I understand, Roland is just a version of Clint Eastwood from the spaghetti westerns that he was in. I want to say his character in the Fistful of Dollars and a few dollars more uh, movies. Right. Does that sound familiar to you? <laughs> yeah, the Man with No Name trilogy is what they tend to call that. Okay. And... So it, it's not like they haven't made movies with a, with a character like that before. And... They were successful enough to have a trilogy. Yojimbo is what they're based on, if I remember right. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyways, I'm, I'm ready to move on to It. <laughs> How about you? Well, sure. Sure, I'm wondering if we should, should we split the episode or just keep going? It's up to you. What do you think? All right, let's just keep going, I guess. Okay. Just, yeah, a month later, there was another adaptation of an, you know, epic Stephen King project. And uh, the funny thing is, long before this one came out, the buzz was overwhelmingly positive. Part of it was the trailer was so strong. I believe it was the most viewed trailer on U in YouTube history. Really? Yeah. Interesting. You know, I, I, I don't know how young people are aware of this, of the book. I guess it's possible they just... That some channel or some place reruns that miniseries from 1990, but certainly young people don't read books. I I, I just it was weird because yeah, it's not just old farts that are like, oh hey, that clown movie looks really good. I can't wait for that to come out. And the studio, New Line Cinema, Warner Brothers, behind this one as well, was projecting, you know, hey, this thing could do 50 million dollars in its opening weekend and. Then right before it came out, they were like, oh, $60 million. And it could be as high as $80 million in its opening weekend. And then the movie came out and it blew everything away. It, it was a record-breaking $123 million opening weekend. And that's got to come from somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. Um, my daughter has recently become sort of interested in... Stephen King. She's not like me where uh, when I read my first Stephen King, I was just like, okay, I'm reading every Stephen King. I want to read it all. I guess I didn't really live up to that, but I sure wanted to. My first Stephen King book that I read was The Dark Half. Okay. And I loved it. I don't know where it stands <laughs> among his canon, you know, with people and, you know, what kind of a ranking it gets. But I enjoyed it anyway. Uh, it took me a long time to ever get around to the older Stephen King books. Um, but just recently, my daughter came to me and said, Hey, I, I want to read a Stephen King book. What one should I read? And I tried to think of it and thought, What book would a 15-year-old girl really enjoy? And I thought about the different books and I was saying, Oh, you know, I really liked this one and I really liked this one. And I finally decided you should read Firestarter. Oh yeah, good choice. That's the one you, sh you should read first. And she read it and she said she loved it. 
She loved it so much and she immediately stole, uh, what was the one she stole off of my shelf right after that? I believe it was The Shining, which is a much bigger book. <laughs> And I don't think, I don't know, she's, she's weird with this. She has to have like six standby books or something. She is always like getting books and then having them in her room for like a year before they ever come back. And I don't know what she's doing <laughs> most of the time. I think she's just watching Netflix instead. But anyways, uh, she became somewhat of a fan because of Firestarter of Stephen King and also recently she's just gotten into horror movies um her and her sister both begged me to let them watch Split so I let them and they liked it but they didn't they weren't blown away by it I guess uh, I think they wanted it to be more gory and violent and less psychological okay which Kind of the opposite of the way I feel, truthfully. Very, just very recently, I made all of my kids, except for the five-year-old, sit down and watch The Sixth Sense, and um, I think they like that a lot. And so, yeah, when we decided we were going to see it, um, I asked my daughter if she wanted to go and see it with me, and she's like, "What is it?" <laughs> and so I sent her the trailer. And she watched and said, that looks amazing. I'm in. <laughs> and um, so we all went and saw it together. Um, it was weird because I, I felt like, should I be bringing my 15 and 13 year old daughters to this R-rated movie? Oh, man, I don't know. And then I got there and there was like six year olds and eight year olds all in the rows behind me. And I was just like, oh, well. I guess I'm the good parent then. What the crap is going on here? And when there was just crazy stuff, there was one point where somebody just totally screamed like, ah! and I tried to look back and see who it was. <laughs> if it was one of those kids or if it was just somebody dorking off, you know what I mean? I couldn't tell in the dark, unfortunately. What was your opinion of this film? Oh, well, it, it was quite good, man. Um, I don't know. So, you know, I, I fancy myself a writer. And sometimes I'll see movies and be like, geez, I could have done better than that. And I felt that way uh -huh. when we saw Dark Tower. It's like I could adapt The Gunslinger, and I think it would be a more satisfying movie. And I think it would have made more money just because it wouldn't have been been there, done that. Uh, but I don't know that I could do a better adaptation of it, or rather of the children have half of it. The, I, I didn't think it was a perfect movie, and there were a couple of moments where I sort of scratched my head, and I don't know how well you remember the book, but there were moments where I was just like, they expect us to have read the book, right? Because <laughs> this would not mean anything if you hadn't read the book. And it's like, well, that's weird. One, I'm going to give you two examples. One of them is Bill Denbro rides an old, clunky, antique bicycle in 1989. And with a magic marker, he's written the word silver on its side. And it's never remarked upon. The bike is never called silver or anything like that. There's no explanation for why he would be riding a bike from the 50s or 60s. It's just there because in the book, that was the bike that he rode and he would say, hi-ho, silver away. Not that he did that in the movie. And then, yeah, there's another very similar thing. Uh, and, and there are several. These are just two examples. But at one point in the movie, Pennywise the Clown says, beep, beep, Richie. It's apropos of nothing. It's only there because in the book, the kids kept saying, beep, beep, Richie. As like a euphemism for, okay, you you need to stop talking. Bring it down a notch. Beep, beep, Richie. Stop it. Shut up. Yeah, like a, a horn honking at him to, to warn him or something like that. Beep, beep, Richie. You're about to crash. But they don't do it in the movie. There's just that line 
once from the clown. And it's just like, okay, I guess that's for me, but it doesn't work if you don't have the kids saying it. Anyhow, there were, there were lots of moments like that where I was just like, was this something from an earlier draft that's sort of referring to a scene that's no longer in the movie? And, <laughs> and there, there were things like that. And I found it interesting that the, uh, the filmmaker chose to keep some things the way that they were in the 1958 version of it, as opposed to this is the 1989 version of it. That's when this movie took place. But then there were other things where it's just like, well, we're, we're going to update that so that it's more modern, so that so that it will resonate with millennials. But I, I, I don't know if the mindset of, some, of a kid in 1989 is the same as the mindset of a kid in 2017. I, I just I don't know. All I know is that reading that book, these kids seemed so real and so alive to me. And then there was the 1990 miniseries. And even though I was still young at the time, it rang very untrue. It rang false. It was a sanitized television version. I was just like aware these aren't real kids. And this is none of this is real. It just doesn't feel right. But the 2017 version, those felt like real kids again to me. Yeah. Yeah. There was something about that. It was just like, wow, there is, there's truth to this, to the way these kids are talking and the way that these kids are feeling that resonated with me. And I, I, I like that. I still feel like the movie was truncated. And it was too short. I know it was supposed to have taken place over like three months, but it didn't feel like that. It felt like it took place over like seven days. And yeah, it did. I th- uh, this is the thing that I felt that it needed, and I felt that it was too short as well, because every scene was Pennywise scaring somebody, or the bullies beating somebody up. There was nothing else in between. There was no time to catch your breath in between each one of the scares, you know, it's like, oh, kids in the library, oh, he's looking at a book and oh, it's a scary book. You know, oh, okay, so now kid went to see his dad at the at the synagogue and oh, there's a scary painting. You know, every single scene was one of those scenes, which I guess they had to include all of those. I don't know. It felt like there needed to be a little bit of them playing down in the barrens or whatever it is that that because i know i mean that's probably why the book is a thousand pages long is because it includes that kind of stuff as well so that it feels real and it feels like it takes place over three months i don't know it was just such a breakneck pace which again they're (laughs) adapting a thousand pages, which I suppose they're doing half well, okay, a thousand that's, pages. Sorry, let me interrupt. Okay. They're, they're, they're not doing a thousand pages. I'd say it's about a 400 page right. book story that they're adapting to two hours. If your book was 150 pages long, maybe you could include every scene in your movie. But when your book is... 500 pages or 400 pages long you got to cut a lot of stuff out usually you got to cut characters out in this case they did not and they chose not to and that that was a weird thing there were seven losers and i i this is going to sound super blasphemous but that was just too many (laughs) if there had only been five if we had lost two of those characters and given all of that business to the five characters that remained I think we would have gotten to know them and cared more for those five characters. As it stands, it feels like a Star Trek The Next Generation movie where they've got to give Troy something to do and Worf something to do and Beverly something to do. Yeah, but we're here for Riker and Data and Captain Picard. Those are the three main characters, and they're going to get all of the screen time. But, but oh, nope, here's a scene. What, Barkley is in this one? And... Uh, Barkley, isn't that the dog from Sesame Street? And and instead, you know, it's just I, it's so much stronger when it's an original series movie, and you've got Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. And if the others have anything to do, well, that's fine. But it's not about them; it's about these three. 
And I feel like the three main char- well, I mean, four main characters. We, we had Ban, the fat kid, Bill, the stutterer, Beverly Marsh, the girl, and Richie Tozier, the, the big mouth comedian. Those four were served very, very well in this movie. But the others had less to do, especially Mike Hanlon, the little black kid, or although yeah. in this movie he wasn't a little black kid, he was about 50 years old. <laughs> Mike had very little to do, and Stanley had very little to do. Eddie was, eh, he was on the bubble, you know. He could have been your fifth guy, and he would have, I think, would have benefited greatly from uh, the other two not being there because then we could have got more of the whole stuff with his mother that they, you know, they did some of. And all that stuff is supposed to, you know, all these things from when they were kids are still their issues when they get older. So in the next movie, you know, that stuff is still plaguing them as they come back around. So if you do, if you short shrift anything, then uh, it just hamstrings you for the next go. So I don't know, maybe that's part of the problem is that they're considering that kind of stuff for the future. And they're like, oh, we got to use this. Got to use that. It's like the the Harry Potter movies, you know, they're like, oh, we don't need this crap. Can we cut that out? And J.K. Rowling's just like, oh, uh, actually, I know I haven't written the book yet. But uh, this is going to be important in book seven. <laughs> so can, can you do me a favor and leave that in? Well, I, I don't know how much foreshadowing there was in this for the future version. But my guess is that they'll have an easier time with the adult version. Because this has laid the groundwork. And it'll, it's, it's a sequel. It's one of those where you don't have to explain who Luke, Han, and Leia are anymore. You can just say they're already friends, and now it's time for the adventure to begin right as the movie starts. But yes, I agree with you that we needed a little bit more of them just becoming friends, of them just being kids, uh, just so you could have a breather, too, from the pace of Pennywise jumps out and scares the audience, and then he's gone, and then... It's time for another character to be scared in a different way. And then it's time for them to get beat up by the bully. Yeah. And then they get scared again. And then the bully. In the book, there was this extended scene where they go down to the barrens and they they dam up the stream. And it's, it doesn't involve the clown in any way. It's just kids being kids and it's how they become friends. And and yeah, I missed that. And in instead, the scene where they all they sort of bond in that way is cleaning up the blood in Bev Marsh's bathroom, and this music, this jaunty "Hey, let's get together, yeah, yeah, yeah" music is playing <laughs> during that scene. I was just like, tonally, it was the one scene in the movie that I didn't feel like worked at all. Well, you're you're missing. You skipped the scene where they were at the quarry, though. Where they're all standing there trying to get the courage up to jump. And then Bev comes along, strips off her clothing, and jumps in ahead of them. And then they all hang out and have a good time and okay. go swimming together. You're right. That's, that scene was, was not fraught with uh, jump scares. That's true. That was our one, hey, we became friends scene. And then they never did anything more. But I did feel that that scene in the quarry worked. Yeah. Um. There was just too much stuff going on, and I, I don't know if a lot of stuff was trimmed, if there was a three-hour version, but I think it would be more satisfying if there was. Was it not three hours? It felt like it must have been that long. How long was it? Uh, two hours and 15 minutes long. Oh, really? Huh. I would have guessed more like two and a half, at least. Probably just because I assumed it needed to be... Because it's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that is a very, very bloated book. And I think it's the first King book that was bloated. I mean, it's not bloated like his later stuff would become, but it just, I, I read it as a child and it was difficult to get through because it was so long. I'd never attempted anything that long before. 
and there were extended sequences of the history of Derry, Maine, and what had happened in the past, and it's really well told. King is a fantastic writer, but it did have some flab on it. It wasn't morbidly obese like some of his other stuff, but it... Like Eddie's mom. Right. It was just flabby like Ben as a child. <laughs> the kid who played Ben was excellent, by the way. I mean, all, all the kids were excellent. Yeah, I was surprised. And there was, wasn't one of them where it's like, oh, this kid can't act. They were all really impressive. Did you know any of them from before? I did. We did know Richie was in Stranger Things. Richie was in Stranger Things. And, and I think he was the, probably the standout in this movie of just... Yeah. He was delightful. He was just hilarious. And uh, I have no idea who they'll cast as the adult version of this kid, but good luck. In my mind, when I read the book, the adult version of him was Danny Kaye. What? I guess they can't cast him, though. But they couldn't have cast him when you <laughs> read the book. <laughs> they couldn't have cast him when he wrote the book. Yeah, I, I see uh, Buster Keaton and Mary Pickford myself as the adult versions of these characters. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, sorry. It just the thing that 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 was different about this adaptation of. A King book and the Dark Tower was even though this tells a complete story, if there was never a sequel, I think this is still satisfying. And Dark Tower does the same thing, but it leaves you saying, oh gosh, I hope they make another. And, and it sounds like they're going to. I mean, they'd been talking about it even before the movie came out because the buzz was so high. There's like, oh, New Line is definitely going to finance a sequel and and yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a release date for it by the end of this week. But yeah, just the idea of doing it like this, of telling the children's story, and then one day we'll tell the adult's story, is kind of genius. If you were going to split the book in any way, that's probably the way to do it. Yeah, it's the perfect way. It's funny because my, my daughters had no idea... You know, they haven't read it. They don't know it. And in the end of the credits, when it comes up and it says, It, chapter, chapter one, one, they went, What? And I'm not sure what their uh, reaction really meant. Were they like, Oh, you, you guys, I can't believe you didn't tell me the whole story. What the crap is this all about? Or if they were like, Oh, yay, I can't wait. Or what? I'm not sure exactly. But they said that, and I said, yeah, you saw. They said if it ever comes back, then they would come back and stop it. But yeah, here's here's one thing that I thought was interesting. And I don't know if you'll back the, if you think that this is the case or not. So our bullies all had 80s hair. <laughs> they were all mullets, etc. But our kids... I didn't feel like our main characters, any of them, had 80s hair, except for maybe Beverly, because she did very closely resemble Molly Ringwald, although Molly Ringwald was over and done with by 1989. True. She did cut her own hair. Yeah. She did a good job of it. So did it, <laughs> did it seem that way to you? Or am I just not remembering the past and I only remember mullets or something? Well, you know, it didn't occur to me that they, the kids are not of their time. I mean, you and I were both alive and kicking in 1989. And yeah, there were no moments where it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That didn't exist in 89 or anything like that. I, although it was weird to see cars from like the 60s. <laughs> yeah. In the movie, it was just like, really? Would that still have been driving? Okay, I guess. Derry was a little bit of a I mean I don't know maybe you maybe you don't think so because you lived in a really small town but yeah it seemed so different than the 80s that I knew the town itself because it was like had this like cute little main street and all that kind of stuff and it looked like the town from back to the future but the back 
in the past part, not the future part. That was the 80s part. There wasn't. Wait, wait, sorry. It it felt like Hill Valley from 1955, not 1985. Exactly right. You know, there wasn't the, the Twin Pine Mall. Instead, it was whatever was there before. I guess it was just a field before, wasn't it? But in the book, uh, the adult part is set in the 80s and they go to the mall or they're at the... I know that there's a mall involved in it somewhere. There has been a mall opened in Derry at this point and they go past it or whatever. It's, it's mentioned at some point. And it felt like there should be some more 80s-ness to it kind of felt like we had half and half you know it was like the kids they were having their cake and eating it too right so it was right. it was set in the 80s but it had the feel of the 50s in yeah, case you exactly. were a fan of the book yeah our heroes were 50s heroes our villains were 80s villains <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i think that goes back to what i was saying a minute ago there were things that they updated and then there were things that they left the same And I read an interview with the director where he said, you know, the fears that kids in the 50s had are not the same as the fears that kids have today. And that made me wonder, well, are the fears the kids have today the same as the fears kids had in 1989? I mean, who gives a f*** what kids are afraid of today? The movie doesn't take place today. But I I understand what he's saying. It just irritates me because I hate millennials. (laughs) Oh, all our millennial listeners just turned it off. There were none. Darn. Yeah, that's pretty true. But but if you want to talk about the kids, uh, did they feel real to you? Did it speak to you? Were you moved? What? How did you feel about the kids? The kids were great. And yes, they did feel very real to me. I, uh, it's funny because a lot of times people are afraid to let, you know, a character like Richie exist. In a movie, you know, they don't want some kid that's just swearing his his uh, blue streak. Um, but when it comes down to it, real kids do that. And they seem a little off if you don't have them act the way they would with friends. You know what I mean? If they don't feel realistic like they did in this, you know, they, they totally felt that way. Um... And some of them weren't like that, you know what I mean? Like, Richie was the loud mouth, the one that was always talking and out of control. And the others would just be like, ugh, you know, you're overdoing it. Beep, beep, Richie. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed, I enjoyed their interplay. And, uh, you know, they felt like real friends. Just, you know, like the, the way that uh, Bill took charge, you know, he was... The stuttering kid, but, you know, he found the right motivation and um, was able to overcome that and just kind of be the leader. You know, he was the the one that was the leader and the one that was the heart of the group that, you know, had that. And I really liked his character as well. Yeah, I don't know. I thought that, that it was really good. Unfortunately, like we said earlier, some of them were underserved. Mike and Stanley had barely anything to do, and little personality, really, too. Uh, of the ones that were on screen, they seemed to have the least of the personality. If you hadn't read the book, you almost certainly would not know the names of those two people by the end of the movie. One thing that's weird is that they gave a lot of Mike's business to Ben. Mike was the one that knew the history of Derry and had newspaper clippings and, and knew like the sordid details and stuff of, of what life was like for black kids and black people in the past. Although <laughs> it was still happening to him in the book. And yeah, they instead they gave it to Ben. And, you know, is Mike I, the one that winds up being the librarian when he grows up? Right. He stays there in Derry and hence he doesn't forget but, yeah, I don't think there's any hints toward that in this. I, that That's something I don't really understand. I don't think it's a weakness for the movie. I just sort of feel bad for Mike Hanlon because, yeah, he's he's not really a character much. 
And it's kind of weird, too, that the new kid is the one that knows all the history of their town. Seems like he should be the one that uh, doesn't know and somebody else who's lived there their whole life should uh, be able to say, oh, yeah, this thing that happened, people still talk about it. Well, it seems like they were sort of hinting toward the idea that the people in the town were oblivious to what was going on, that there was a veil pulled over the eyes of people in Derry, and they either willfully ignored or they just wandered through life in a sort of haze. There's one scene, and it was a really strong scene in the movie, where the bullies are mutilating poor Ben Hanscom. And this car pulls up, and you're like, oh, thank God. And there's a man and a woman in the car. They're going to put a stop to this. They look over. They see what's being done to this kid who's crying for help. And they keep driving. And, I mean, it's it's a really chilling moment. Yeah. Because you're like, holy crap, dude. And I don't think it happens again through the movie. But I believe in the book there was an undercurrent of this is a bad place. And the people here are tainted. There is something bad in Derry, and it affects everybody. Yeah. And I think the other scene that I really, really liked in the movie was when Beverly hears the voice coming out of her drain. And she goes over, and then the little hair things come out and grab her and start pulling her. And then she pulls away, and instead it erupts. A volcano of blood out of the thing and it just splatters and it just fills the entire bathroom and she's completely soaked in it and she's freaking out and then her dad comes in and she's like, what's going on, Beverly? She's like, oh, there's the thing and there's the blood and the blood came out everywhere. He's like, what? what are you talking about? What blood? And <laughs> the way that they did it and the movie was so great because the blood is everywhere. There's no way to not see it. And he's walking in it and he's like getting it on him as he's talking and he's looking at her. And, and her hair is all matted down in her face and covered in blood. And he's just like, what do you, what do you mean? You're seeing things. Uh, you worry me. And then he leaves <laughs> and the blood is still there. It's still there days later when she shows it to her friends and uh, they have to clean it up. It doesn't go away for them. They can see it, but no, but the dad doesn't know the difference. And I think that's another indication, you know, that there's... It's, I guess, a little different. I think it's more like they can't see it as opposed to they're deliberately ignoring it, which is more what the... Uh, you know, the bullies being left to do their work with the little fat kid. That one felt more like they purposefully just said, no, I don't, I don't see anything. I'm just going to keep going. But yeah, and that's something that carries through in all of Stephen King. Well, all of, I don't know, in many of his books. He goes back to Derry again in the... Uh, 11, 20, 2, 63, is that what it's called? Is that the date? Right. But yeah, they go back to Derry, and Derry is wrong. You know, there's something wrong in Derry, and the character that goes back there can feel it, and he, he knows it, and he's, it's, something is really wrong in Derry. And in the book, he actually meets Beverly and Richie. Yeah. They're a little bit older. They're like three or four years older and they're in high school and they're like doing a dance competition or I don't know what. Yeah, I mean, it's still going on, obviously, despite the fact that they sent it scurrying, which I guess means that it will be returning in the 80s. <laughs> okay, so there's one other thing I wanted to talk to you about. Uh-huh. And let's go back to that scene on the bridge, the kissing bridge. I had read it in the book, and of course, it's traumatic that this psycho would carve his initials on the stomach of another human being. But actually seeing it in the movie, for me, was much more 
horrific. It was horrifying. And they made a choice, New Line made a choice at some point before they even started filming that this was going to be an R-rated adaptation. And they went all in on the R rating. I think the first scene with the death of poor Georgie is so graphic that it's just like, nope. MPA, we we we're not after a PG thirteen. We just wanted to get this out of the way in this scene. <laughs> yeah. So and there's the language and there's you know adult themes. There's kid on kid violence and uh, that surprised me. I mean, even now knowing the movie is a gargantuan success, somebody somewhere had to have said, "Hey, according to our research, if you guys bring this in." with a PG-13, we will make $28 million more. And how a studio like New Line can say, you know, we're, we're not going to compromise our, the intent of this movie. It is going to be an R. That really surprised me. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder about that. I wonder how much some of the other successes uh, that have existed recently, like Deadpool or Logan... Um, that have been made in recent years and they've gone for the R and the very strong R, we're not fooling around here, R ratings, and have still made plenty of money, how much that has helped something like this to become what it is. Because, yeah, it's, I, I doubt they would have made $28 million more than what they made, right? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, that I just pulled that number out of my uh, standpipe but <laughs> but that is the usual assumption. But I'm just saying, it made record amounts of money, so... Okay, well, I, I still think it would have made more money had it been PG-13. You think so? You think people would have been as well, interested in it if it didn't look like it was going to be horrifically violent? Those eight-year-olds that you saw at the screening could have brought their friends. But I, I just... I, you brought your kids... <laughs> to see it and it would yeah it was rated r and you'd never done that before and i just wonder you know how you would have felt how how the movie would have felt differently if it had been pg-13 and you know did it bother you that it was r it didn't truthfully i don't know why it probably should but i feel like my kids have made it to the age where they can understand this kind of stuff after going through film school and, you know, there's, there's a lot of things and people out there who, who will tell you, oh, you know, this movie would have been so great if they just kept this bit out or just not done this. I would have loved Glory if that one guy's head hadn't blown up in that one scene. I had a film professor who actually showed us the scene from Glory where the guy's head blows up specifically to make the point about how sometimes you have to do that kind of stuff in a film and exactly what this guy's head blowing up signified in the mind of the main character and how his view of what war was went down the drain with the blood and brains of that guy. I've learned that, you know, certain things have to be told the way they are. The way they're told, you know, I mean, sometimes things are gratuitous, admittedly, but, you know, it is a hard story. It's dark and it's a horror movie and it needs to be treated like a horror movie. I don't want it to be watered down. I don't want it to feel less than it is. You know what I mean? I don't want them to always cut away before the bad stuff happens so that you don't ever see the bad stuff, because then you kind of get desensitized to the bad stuff. Bad stuff doesn't feel bad, maybe, if you don't actually see it happen. You know, you, you might just think war is glorious if you don't see that guy's head explode and realize just how awful and tragic and rough war really is. I, I was going to say maybe Georgie's death doesn't, resonate as much with you if you don't see how horribly he died but then again bill didn't see it and it still haunted him 
So maybe that's not necessarily the case. I don't know. But yeah, I just, there's like that company, and I want to say they're called Vid Angel. Okay. Where they take movies and they sanitize them for you. That kind of stuff. I, I hate it. And, you know, most of my family are, are the exact opposite. None of them went to film school, so they haven't been indoctrinated with the same crap that I was indoctrinated with. But they're always just like, oh, yes, I would love that movie if they just didn't say the F word a hundred thousand times. And so they'll put up with a movie where they're watching it and there's weird silences all over the place. And still think that, hey, I saw that movie. I know what it was like. Even though they watched some weird sanitized version of it. A lot of the people that I know that do that do it for religious reasons. They feel like it's it's evil, it's bad to watch the movie, and I don't understand how they can justify still watching the movie just without the one scene or the without the F words. You still saw the movie. <laughs> you know, you you the whole point of whatever it is that you stand for is not to watch it. But you still watched it. You just closed your eyes at the one point or the other point or whatever. Uh, I find it ridiculous and I hate it. And yeah, I don't know. I, I would like my kids, you know, to be able to understand reality. And to understand, you know, when, when things are awful, just how awful they are uh, and so forth. And not have a, a sanitized version rose-colored glasses version of everything. So you can look at things with real understanding. Of course, there's a point where you can get to that, and there's a point when you're too young. And I think most of those kids that were in that show with us were probably too young. 13, 15, you're probably fine. Eight? Eh, not so much. Well, see, I draw the line at three. That's a respectable line. I'm just going to bring my nephew to the to the movie three years ago. <laughs> Anyhow, I just I that surprised me before it came out to discover that it was R just because for the last 20 years, just the PG-13 has held sway. And, and you and I have seen movies that should have been R, seen movies that were made as R's that got cut down to a PG-13 just because that's the magic rating where, you know, that's going to make a ton of money. And I don't know. I think that that is admirable when they can say the the integrity of the story we're trying to tell is more important than the dollars, the potential dollar sign that you guys are talking about. Yeah, I always like it when people have integrity. I like to wave to them as they pass me by. <laughs> There was one other thing. The clown itself. We didn't really talk about Pennywise, whether he was scary, how you felt Bill Skarsgård did as the clown. But I, I got to tell you, that first scene where he's in the grate and he was drooling as he was talking. I mean, just like long streams of drool coming. That was really upsetting. <laughs> yeah. I, I I was disturbed by it. But I wondered, what did you think of his performance? I thought he was really good. I, I don't know. Uh, there was a lot of times when the clown moved in really weird ways. He would suddenly rush at you really fast and his head would like shake back and forth as he was coming forward and stuff. I don't know if I understood what the deal was with that. I did like, you know, the parts where he was just creepy. You know what I mean? Where you're just like... That, that, begin, that first scene where he's talking to Georgie is probably the best bit of him being a clown where he spins the nonsense about how his train or whatever it was crashed down there and there's the elephants and all the stuff down there with him and they and just his mouth was so scary his head was gigantic I assume that was like prosthetic stuff or something I nope many many paint chips as an infant oh okay but yeah I never felt like he was as scary in the scenes after that. And I wonder, is it because I knew that Georgie was not going to survive? But on all the rest of the times, I knew that Beverly and, and Ben and Mike were going to survive, where they were going to get away. 
Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know, though, if my knowledge of the source material tainted that or if just they paid extra special attention. They worked really, really hard on the first scene because that's the first impression that audiences are going to get of our villain. Yeah, I don't know uh, what's behind it. But yeah, I I was the same way. The other thing about when he's down in the drain there, you can't see him as well. He's there in the dark and you just see his eyes glowing. Oh, I dug that with the eyes, yeah. And a little bit of his face and stuff. You can't really get a good look at him, which always makes something even more scary, you know what I mean? When it's kind of obscured, you know, we always talk about how, oh, if you just see a little bit of the monster, then it's much more scary. Once you finally see it all, you're just like, oh, is that what it is? Which we kind of never saw with this, you know, the the whole alien spider thing that never came out. I guess maybe they're saving it for the next half? I think they might be. I think that was the last thing that the, the adults remembered. And although Stan remembered it. And so I'm thinking, yeah, maybe that was something that they... Hopefully they they shot it so that we can flash back to the kids making this discovery. Although it probably still works with the adults making the discovery. And the kids never knew. Just uh, that, that, that to me was something very disturbing. Was, and yeah, spoilers, sorry. It is female. That to me was upsetting. I was just like, oh no, because it portended there are going to be more of these things. Yeah. I, I look forward to uh, the next, to chapter two. Um, I do hope that they don't get greedy and say, well, we're going to do a chapter two and a chapter three. I would like them to just stick with this idea of we get the kid version, then we get the adult version. Yeah, it would be weird to do two parts of the adult version. I also feel like the adult version was the smaller half. Oh, see, I felt like it was the opposite, but but it's it's the the half that doesn't resonate as strongly. I don't know. I just, you know, it's all them remembering or whatever coming back to it and then they just kind of all go there. They go down into the thing, you know, there's no build up all that kind of stuff. Maybe I don't just don't remember it well enough. I also feel like I remember the adult half of it less than I do the child part. Maybe because it resonates more. We'll see. Yeah, it, it, maybe it will be difficult for us to embrace these adult replacements. But I don't think so. I mean, as long as they don't hire somebody that has a ton of baggage... Where it was like, oh, whoa, 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 that's not Stan Uris. That's Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get me one of these. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, yes, I guess uh, I, I look forward to it, uh, and I will be happy to pay money to see the second one. Yeah, I think it will be cool. You know, okay, so, all right. Well, I guess we have uh, said our piece about these two films. Yeah, I wonder, is there something else that we have to see next? Probably not till Thor. All right. Well, uh, thanks for hanging out with me for a bit and doing this show and let me report on my homework that I did. Well, thanks for doing your homework, young man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks everybody for listening. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And I think what we have determined from our little chat here is that you should see it and you should not see The Dark Tower. But of course, you probably already have if you listened to this at all. So there you go. All right. I have been Rish Outfield. And I've been Big Anklevich. See you, folks. We all float down here. You'll float too. You'll You'll float float too. too. You'll You'll float float too. too. That Gets My Goat is produced under Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives License, which between you and me means nothing.
You say, Dork Tower comes out this weekend. And I said, yeah, should we see it and do a show on it? You said, sure, but I must warn you, I'm predisposed not to like it. And I said, you're not the only one. And then, after you'd seen it, you said, well, if you want to waste ten bucks on it so we can have a conversation, let me know. Then you asked, did you decide whether or not, whether to see the Dark Tower or not? And I said, I don't suspect I will, unless you really want to repeat your rant from the other night. Ah, so I had already ranted by that point. And then you say, but you could give me your opinion. And then you said that today it's at 18%. And I was surprised that it was lower than Valerian. And you said that they made up bullshit about how 19 is the magic number of the tower. Yeah, I hate that. And so it opened um, at, at 1919. So 719 it opened, and it opened for $19 million, which I don't think was intentional. And, it, <laughs> and then, yeah, right as I saw it in the theater, it had a 19% on Rotten Tomatoes, which, again, I don't think was intentional. But then by the time the weekend was over, it had gone down to 18. It's... Oh, the Dark Tower was foiled. I said I didn't get to see it last night, so we'll have to hold off on our conversation till next week. Then, oh, no, here's the next week. Are we recording tonight? And I say, I never managed to see the movie, so I don't know whether you want to talk about something else. And so we didn't record anything again. And then... I text you on the Monday and I say, are you asleep? I'm going to need to sleep soon. Maybe we should do this tomorrow. I say, I did my homework though, so I want my A. <laughs> that was me begging to finally do this episode because I actually went out and saw the movie because I felt guilty because you asked me about it two weeks in a row. And then you were no longer interested. <laughs> So yeah, this, this whole episode is me just, you know, I went and saw a second movie so that I could force you to talk about the first one that I saw. <laughs> I mean, we probably don't have to include this in the episode. I was just looking up Bill Skarsgård. Arr. He's Stellan Skarsgård's youngest son. Is he? Oh, and here's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> that I've read is sometimes to scare the child actors, he would deliver his lines in Swedish and they'd be kind of horrified by that. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that would horrify me as well. <laughs> it would horrify anyone, I think. <laughs> Anyways, I was just looking him up and he, the first credit on his list of things that he is in is a series of that is filming now called Castle Rock. Oh, he's on Castle Rock? Yeah, Interesting. Castle Rock, I suppose you know about it. I've never heard of it, but it's a show based on stories of Stephen King that will intertwine characters and themes from the fictional town of Castle Rock. The Bad Robot production. Yeah, I've, JJ really enjoyed doing that uh, JFK miniseries, and so, yeah, they're they're doing this one as well. But yeah, this could be really interesting because Stephen King has a shit ton of short stories out there that you could, you know, do episodes or more of. Plus, he has various books that have... I'm curious, Alan Pangborn, that one I think I know. Yeah. That's the sheriff, the sheriff from the Dark Half. Not the first sheriff that's killed by Cujo, but the, the replacement sheriff. He's the main character in... Needful, Needful things, things as yeah, well. that's what I was thinking of him from. Henry Deaver, Ruth Deaver is played by Sissy Spacek. The rest are just. There's a kid named Toby. No. There's a teenage maid. There's a nightgown girl. There's a kid in here whose whose credit is nose picker. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> he made his IMDb to be no. I want to see if he has any other credits. Yeah, he's uh, gonna be popular in the playground. There, uh, nobody's <laughs> gonna mock that. Popular on the. Uh, he has one other credit. Ass scratcher. For a show called Daddy's Home Two. Yeah, that comes out this Christmas. 
It's a one-two punch because it stars Marky Mark and Will Ferrell. Ooh. Yeah, in this, in that movie, he's known as Little Boy. That's a step up from Nose Picker, I guess. <laughs> 